with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Yazan Alderazi. He was an uh, interventional uh, neurologist. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Alderazi when he started his career um, as an uh, interventional stroke neurologist at Texas Tech in Lubbock. Um, he has continued his career in Houston and is currently the division medical director of the Cerebrovascular Disease and Neurointerventional Surgery at HCA Houston Healthcare, um, the Gulf Coast Division. So um, help me welcome Dr. Alderazi as he talks about um, vertebral and basilar artery dissections. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's great to see a lot of uh, uh, familiar faces in the audience. I don't have any financial disclosures um, relevant to this talk. I will be discussing some off-label use of medical devices because uh, there are no on-label devices for dissection. Um, this is the overview of our talk. Um, when we talk, come to management of any medical condition, um, we like to think about what tests am I going to order, how am I going to approach the treatment uh, of the patient, and uh, most importantly, the patient experience. What's the patient's concerns, expectations, and ideas surrounding their disease. And on the, the right hand side, um, some of the things going through our minds are what's the diagnosis? What are the complications to watch out for? How do I monitor this condition? What's the prognosis and clinical course on treatment? Um, the epidemiology and overview is familiar to, to most of us, at least most aspects of it are. Uh, dissections commonly affect patients in their 40s, but really the whole spectrum. When it comes to stroke, we're thinking about stroke in the young. However, a growing body of literature shows that a large proportion of patients with dissection are actually older, and they may present atypically because they don't have pain, often with their presentation. Um, and dissections are asymptomatic or present with pain uh, or neurological complications. And on the right-hand side, the neurological complications are present in about 70%. It doesn't always present initially with the neurological complications, so the patients may present to other specialists first. Um, ischemia is the number one on our list. Um, and when it comes to vertebral basilar dissections, um, cerebellar ischemia and Wallenberg syndrome are the two things that we look for. So these are often things that are missed in the initial ER evaluation. Um, uh, about um, the thing, uh, 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 another one of the neurological complications we get concerned about, especially on the interventional side, is subarachnoid hemorrhage. With intracranial dissection, about half the patients with intracranial dissection will have subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then rarely with pseudoaneurysms, it can be mass effect. Furthermore, into the epidemiology, we can see the incidence of vertebral and vascular dissections and carotid artery dissections together are similar to the incidence of multiple sclerosis. Obviously, multiple sclerosis occurs, uh, has a, a much larger prevalence because dissection usually resolves. That's why it's a bigger part of our practices. Um, carotid dissections are more common than vertebral dissections. They're common in ischemic stroke. Um, they're not rare in ischemic sort of populations, uh, and neither are they rare in trauma populations, but they're not exactly common conditions. Um, the most enriched patient population are the stroke in the young population. Patients that are in their 30s and 40s having strokes, about 20 to 30 percent of them will be, uh, the section will be the underlying cause, which currently is transitioning from number one cause of stroke in the young in this age group to number two, given the prevalence of obesity, hypertension, and small vessel disease that's kind of overtaking it. Uh, as our population changes, uh, the epidemiology changes. I won't dwell too much on the pathology. Um, uh, the cardinal feature is blood within the layers of the artery, either close to the luminal side and the subintima or close to the external side on, underneath the adventitia and those are the patients that have pseudoaneurysms basically a contained rupture of the vessel um, locations for dissections um, they can be extracranial 
or intracranial. And the intracranial ones are the more ones associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage. In the vertebral and in the posterior circulation, the V3 segment of the vertebral artery is the commonest location. Um, and intracranial leads to the V4 segment, the next segment up there. Further along the posterior circulation, it's much more rare to have dissections. And in the anterior circulation, it's really um, a few centimeters above the internal carotid artery origin in the neck, and often at the petrous segment at the skull base. Um, these are the vertebral artery segments. We have the um, pre-vertebral segment, um, uh, which is as the artery comes from the subclavian artery going into the foramina, the holes in the transverse processes. That's a V1 segment. And then the holes of the transverse processes in the neck, the cervical segment is V2. And then as the artery exits the cervical segment, exits the foramina, it's a V3 segment. And then it enters the, the intracranial portion through the foramen magnum, that's the V4 segment. Here's a, a, the lines to kind of show where they are. And on the lateral, this is the view on this angiogram. Looking at the cranial view, those are the lines, the V2 segment, the V3 segment, and the intracranial V4 segment. Again, V2 is where it's within the, neuro, the foramen and the transverse process. And the intracranial V4 segment, you can see the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the, one of the major arteries to the cerebellum, comes out of the V4 segment. So some of us divide this segment into the pre-pica and post-pica V4 segment. And for brownie points, the anterior spinal artery comes from the post-pica V4 segment. As on the interventional side, this matters to us as far as if you have a pseudoaneurysm and you may need to intervene, uh, the relationship to the posterior inferior cerebellar artery is important. For us more broadly as neurologists, involvement to posterior cerebellar artery, either from distal emboli most commonly, um, or direct involvement can relate, result in cerebellar strokes, and they can often be clinically hard to detect, so we monitor these patients with uh, CT. The risk factors, trauma is a common risk factor, and this can be major trauma, like on the trauma service, motor vehicle collisions, um, um, falls from uh, um, uh, above uh, ground level, or low energy trauma, or in even trivial trauma, which is more common to see on the neurology service. Underlying risk factors that the patient may have are fibromuscular dysplasia, some connective tissue diseases. Uh, there's also an association with hypertension and association with recent respiratory infection. Again, there's a relationship between inflammation, vessel injury that we don't quite understand, but is starting to develop among our literature. Um, the trauma population we often talk about blunt, non-penetrating trauma, um, and its incidence in this population is similar to the, the proportion of patients that are, that are getting it with ischemic st stroke population. Historically, it was associated with very high morbidity and mortality. More recent uh, studies show that this is less, and that's probably due to two factors. One is earlier recognition and treatment, and the other uh, factor is more broad use of CT angiography. So we're picking up a lot of dissections that were not present, uh, were not detected previously. Um, motor vehicle collisions is the commonest cause and accounts for more than half of these trauma uh, dissections. Um, Tips are patients who have fractures in the cervical spine or other fractures in the head and neck um, uh, uh, often harbor these injuries. And about 80% with neurologic of patients that present with neurological complications will develop it after a latent period. So it's important to detect these patients prior to the neurological um, event. And the trauma service uh, services now um, uh, routinely watch patients for these uh, injuries. Um, on the trauma side, if you look at the trauma literature, they use a blunt cerebrovascular injury scale. Some people refer to it as a Denver, Denver scale. Uh, the, um, and they grade it based on the anatomy of the lesion. Uh, grade one is uh, interluminal um, uh, restriction, less than 25%. Grade two is more than 25%, and that's whether it's a dissection flap or a thrombus. It doesn't matter what's causing the restriction. Pseudoaneurysm is grade three. Uh, grade four is occlusion. 
it doesn't really kind of follow uh, the no, n way we would intuitively think about it. And then grade five is a transection or with free stabilization or AV fistula. Some people put AV fistula in the grade three category. Looking at carotid artery disease, there seems to be a progression of stroke incidence going from grade one to two. That doesn't exist in the posterior circulation. And those were the initial studies looking at this grading. And then more recently, our population studies showing that with more recent detection of cases and treatment, the complication rate is much, much lower. Vertebral artery collaterals are important when we talk about um, uh, risk of stroke. The collateral circulation in the posterior circulation is more robust. Uh, this is an example of a patient with a vertebral artery occlusion on the right and collateral from the contralateral vertebral artery supplying the whole posterior circulation. Another example is the sending cervical artery in the neck. They can have multiple levels at each of the um, Intervertebral disc levels, there's collaterals where it can connect with the vertebral artery. The occipital artery can connect at the C2 and C1 level. That comes from the external carotid artery. Uh, and also the posterior communicating arteries can, can connect uh, supplying blood from the anterior circulation downwards filling the posterior circulation. And usually with this robust channel, most patients with vertebral artery occlusion don't go on to infarction, um, thankfully. So this is where we're at. We finished our a little bit longer introduction. Um, we'll talk about the tests to consider and summarize them. We'll talk about the treatments and summarize it and uh, how to address the patient's concerns. The, in, in the back of my mind, the kind of uh, questions that I always have when I see a patient with dissection is, is it extracranial or intracranial? Is there a pseudoaneurysm present? Is this associated with a high energy trauma or other traumatic injuries? Um, and are there any ischemic or hemorrhagic complications present? And each of these factors will modify our diagnostic or treatment approach. So another way of thinking about, and I think the purpose of a lot of this talk while reviewing the evidence is also to give you the framework of how we, we like to approach this, testing in the ischemic stroke setting, in the sub subarachnoid hemorrhage setting, the traumatic setting, and testing for monitoring. And basically it boils down to two things, arterial assessment, what's the artery look like? And um, uh, the parenchymal assessment, has there been any subarachnoid hemorrhage or ischemic stroke present? Is there cerebral edema? Um, the testing and trauma criteria kind of developed over time through multiple societies, the Denver criteria, the Western Trauma Association, the Eastern Trauma Association, going from the 90s all the way till about a decade ago. And the most recent review, there was really no randomized controlled trials to give us class one or level two evidence base. So really talking about what they describe as class two or three, what we typically think about is, is, is lower level evidence, perspective, studies, retrospective studies, and uncontrolled studies. And that's the current state of play in the trauma literature. This is a busy slide with a lot of detail on the left, but to summarize it, the criteria that they look for um, are signs of obvious ischemia, uh, neurological signs, or signs of severe injury or active bleeding. Um, on the risk factors, the risk factors, a lot of them are different fractures in the head and neck or other severe injuries or high mechanism um, uh, traumas. But 30% of our patients won't have any of these risk factors when we went on to, to see are these criteria validated. So there's a, a little bit of art in application to um, uh, detecting these. And on the trauma services in the United States, we are on the side of a little bit over diagnosis to capture this patient population. Catheter angiography used to be the standard treatment, uh, standard diagnostic modality. Um, uh, but now is no longer the imaging modality of choice for diagnosis. Um, uh, even though it is cost effective in high risk populations, the early very high risk populations. And now we really move to CT angiography as our main diagnostic modality. 
uh, where we reserve cerebral angiography for equivocal cases, or if there's high suspicion and the treatment, the other tests are, are negative uh, or poor quality. This is an example, not a trauma patient, but a left carotid artery dissection, uh, Horner syndrome, left itosis, and meiosis. This is an older angiogram. Our more recent angiograms are even better quality. The first picture on the left is a digital subtraction angiogram, and then one showing without subtraction, showing the bone, and the reconstruction where we brought in the bone a little bit more. And you can see the carotid artery has a small pseudoaneurysm in the cervical segment, then a stenosis with a dissection flap, and then as it curves in the pizza segment of the, of the internal carotid artery, there's another kind of false lumen there. Um, th this is another case, a patient that had a left middle cerebral artery infarct. Uh, this is not a trauma patient. She came in with, a, we, we did her stroke workup, MRI and CTA, and the CTA suggested a left internal carotid artery dissection, but we weren't quite sure. So we got a diagnostic angiogram to co confirm it, and the diagnostic angiogram was completely normal. So the example of how we would use it sometimes. Uh, this is an intracranial view of normal angiogram. Uh, the next patient is a 52-year-old woman with risk factors. She has rheumatoid arthritis, hypertension, obesity, and a heart murmur. She presented with acute left hemi hemiparesis and was found to have um, no cortical signs, but just a face uh, and, and arm and leg weakness. The CTA suggested the right middle sleeve RT stenosis. Sorry, I don't have the images from a previous uh, institution. Um, uh, and there's some atypical features. So we did an angiogram to try to clarify it. And there's a little magged up view of it. There is a dissection line, a little dissection flap there, that white line in the middle of the middle cerebral artery. And the middle cerebral artery is thickened because there's a true lumen and false lumen. So this really helped us make, make the diagnosis. We managed this patient medically. This is actually one of the intracranial dissections where we did use antithrombotics. We did use aspirin for this patient and it resolved over time. So. CTA has been examined, talking about sensitivity and specificity versus catheter angiography, and has good performance characteristics. And it was also found to be cost effective, which made it the imaging modality of choice for our trauma population in, when it comes to blunt trauma, and for a lot of our stroke patients given the rapid availability. And if you think about timeline of when did CTA become really commonly available in our ERs, it's the early 2000s, the same time where we were revising these criteria. Uh, when it comes to penetrating injury, a little bit less um, good on the performance characteristics of CT angiogram. It's still our first modality of choice, especially if somebody has a penetrating injury, they're not going to get an MRI, and going straight to angio is not the right choice. But we, um, uh, more of our penetrating injury patients will get angiography, especially for control of bleeding. These are some examples. Um, sorry, I don't um, know how to use the pointer here. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, on the axial image on the carotid artery just anterior to the vertebral column on the right, you can see there's a double density uh, or a double lumen, and there's a dissection flap. Uh, in the middle picture, um, uh, there's a, a small pseudoaneurysm in the carotid artery where the arrow is, and on the axial view that shows the, the, car the carotid um, uh, pseudoaneurysm. This is the same patient, but now looking at her vertebral arteries on the other level, there's that kind of double lumen, false lumen, true lumen of the vertebral artery dissection, a dissection or flap, uh, sorry, pseudoaneurysm or flap in the middle picture. Sometimes if they're small, it's hard to tell what's a dissection, uh, uh, dissection flap and what's a small pseudoaneurysms. Thank thankfully, in the posterior circulation in the vertebral artery V2 segment, Pseudoaneurysms tend not to be big because everything is so constrained by the tissues that are there. Um, and this is another patient um, recently from our practice, um, uh, a trauma patient, and the right vertebral artery here, as it gets that V3 segments coming into the V4 segment, getting through the skull base, the patient's kind of tilted. You can see the first two images, the right vertebral artery is open, the second two images, you see the left vertebral artery has a, a, a stenosis because of a dissection, and the lateral axial view on the left showing the dissection there as well. MRI has utility. Um, I'm going to start with the right-hand side. It's the best test for infarct. Um, uh, so on our, our non-traumatic patients, it's a great tool. Uh, it can also show subarachnoid hemorrhage, especially if there's a delayed presentation. Uh, on the arterial side, uh, it can show an intra, 
mural th thrombus, which is basically uh, a hematoma, which is the, the, the diagnosis of a dissection. Um, T1 plus fat suppressed images traditionally were the best imaging modality to get for it. It appears day two to 14 after symptom onset. Uh, and may compress the, the true lumen, giving a signal void. One of the randomized controlled trials, and we have two we're going to talk about, the TREAT CAD study, cervical artery dissection study, gave us criteria for what to look for on an MRI for patients who have a dissection. Things like flaps, intramural thrombus, a pseudoaneurysm, or an occlusion. When it, when it resolves, you feel long, residual kind of filiform stenosis underlying it, or a double lumen. Uh, so MRA, we basically have two types of MRA when it comes to this section, the time of flight MRA, which is good, but not really great and not ideal for uh, diagnosing dissection. Contrast enhanced MRA is excellent for dissections in the neck. Um, MRA is not the greatest tool in the trauma setting, but for a lot of institutions where stroke protocols are MRI driven, my institution is not, um, this could be incorporated into your protocols. Um, if uh, What I really like to use, uh, uh, and what there's literature for, for MRA, is the follow-up of patients with dissection. Uh, it's a useful test to get contrast enhanced MRA of the neck and the time of flight of the uh, intracranially. And in institutions where you can work with your radiologist to set up a vessel wall imaging protocol that further enhances the ability to detect the intramural uh, um, uh, thrombus inside the vessel. And to talk a little bit about vessel wall imaging, there are different ways to do it with normal standard MRI technology, especially if you have a three Tesla scanner. Some of the stuff can be done on a one Tesla scanner. Um, the different uh, companies, vendors have different names for the sequences, space for Siemens, Q for GE, Vista for Philips, and also this double inversion recovery sequence that can be done um, uh, with multiple vendors. Um, this is an example of a double inversion recovery, so-called black blood imaging. Basically, we're suppressing CSF signal and suppressing blood signal, and the vessel is surrounded by CSF intracranially and, 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 and has blood in it, and extracranially it has blood inside, inside it. When you suppress both, you get to see the vessel wall, and on the left side of the image, that's intramural hemorrhage, the hematoma, I should say. So traumatic injuries, kind of bouncing back to the traumatic side of things. Uh, what is the recommendations as far as monitoring? We monitor a, a bit earlier because it's more dynamic in the trauma setting, the high energy trauma setting. So we, for grade one to three injuries, so this is a interluminal narrowing, whether it's a small amount or a large amount, or pseudoaneurysm patients, we monitor them with the scan within a week or so because patients can expand their pseudoaneurysms or there can be a resolution or worsening of the interluminal narrowing during that period in the trauma setting. If the patient has a complete occlusion, we generally don't need to monitor it early. We just do the late monitoring around three months or six months down the road. And for extravasation, usually you're just intervening. Uh, so there's not often much monitoring involved. And the patients have variable clinical course with this. On the spontaneous dissection side, where we typically see them on the, the stroke service or sometimes in our clinics, um, about most of our patients, about uh, three quarters of them will re resolve spontaneously and geographically, uh, and there's a small recurrence rate. So the summary for our testing, two key slides for sl summary here. Uh, best performance characteristics is with cerebral angiography, but it's really as a as needed test, not first line test at all by any means. CTA is first line for most cases. Some institutions where you have contrast, enhanced MRA in the neck, uh, especially if you combine it with vessel wall imaging, is an excellent tool. And for me, in my institution, this is our, our favorite modality for follow up imaging. Um, a Doppler we didn't talk, touch on is really an in, inadequate tool for, for what we need to look for for vertebral artery dissections. Uh, so another way of looking at it, the categories in our minds thinking about it, ischemic stroke, if you're a CTA based for your stroke protocol, CTA plus MRI. If you're MRA based, then it's MRA contrast enhanced 
plus MRI. Uh, for subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, these guys, patients are going to get angiography and a CTA, plus minus CTA in the beginning. In the setting of trauma, it's much, much more weighted towards CT angiography. And for monitoring, contrast enhanced MRA plus vessel wall imaging, if you have it, CTA is still a good monitoring modality as well and, and probably more accessible for most patients. Um, the next section of our, our talk now, uh, we're you know almost halfway through. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about treatment, and then we'll summarize with with the patient concerns. So this is the overall paradigm for treatment. Are there acute reperfusion therapies that I need to give this patient that's presenting with ischemic stroke and an underlying dissection? Can I thrombolyze this patient? What about the role for mechanical thrombectomy? And uh, for the patients, all the patients, and even the patients who don't have the acute reperfusion, what are we going to do for secondary prevention? Um, we don't have randomized control trials looking specifically at dissection and stroke and TPA or tenecteplase, alteplase or tenecteplase, but we do have some reviews of different data sets the national inpatient sample, some stroke registries in Switzerland, um, and multi center, multinational studies. And they've looked at them in different ways, sometimes comparing patients with cervical artery dissections with thrombosis versus patients who got thrombosis for other means. Some of the other studies looked at patients with cervical artery dissection who got thrombolysis and then compared them to cervical artery dissection without thrombosis. Generally, looking at all of the studies together, the summary that we get is, for the most part, this is as safe as it is for the normal stroke population. Um, there is no signal for additional harm, and most likely the patients benefit from, from it. We did find a few of the studies suggesting that patients with dissection actually don't do as well in general as a population compared to um, uh, patients with other causes of stroke, um, especially if you age and sex max control, uh, control them. But sometimes you get into a, a, a quandary of there of small vessel disease versus dissection or PFO versus dissection. Uh, and the quality of data is not good enough to answer that question. But the big summary is if the patient has an extracranial dissection, not intracranial, not intradural dissection, um, the uh, thrombolysis is still reasonable to offer the patients. How about thrombectomy? We even have less evidence when it comes to thrombectomy. The patients were generally not included in the randomized controlled trials for mechanical thrombectomy. But since mechanical thrombectomy in 2015 became standard of care, and now we're coming on to what the seven, well, we're already at the seven year anniversary of this. Um, we have multiple registries that have been done in multiple countries. This is the German registry showing about 2.4% of the thrombectomy population had underlying dissections. And generally they got similar reperfusion and um, a similar complication rate, uh, but a, um, a signal that their dissection patients didn't do as well as the other patients just in general as a group. Um, there's more that we need to look into why that's the case. Um, uh, but in general, uh, th mechanical thrombectomy is still an option for the patients if the vessel can be accessed. Um, now we get to our randomized control trials finally. Um, we have two randomized control trials on the secondary prevention side. So these are patients with cervical artery dissections looking at um, treatment with antiplatelet agents versus antithrombotics. As neurologists, we've been debating this for over 20 years. Um, and we will still continue to debate it, unfortunately. The CADIS trial, which was the um, UK-based trial, mainly UK, UK and Australia, uh, that seemed to sway us towards you can use anything, uh, examined patients with cervical artery dissection, whether or not they had symptoms, and uh, compared aspirin versus anticoagulation. Uh, sorry, compared antiplatelets, whether it was aspirin, aspirin plus dipyridamol, aspirin plus clopidogrel, um, or clopidogrel alone, uh, versus anticoagulation, which was heparin, and then transitioning to warfarin. And they looked at the recurrence rate. That trial was stopped due to futility because the event rate was so low in both arms. So we thought, great, we can treat these patients with whatever we want. And that led to a shift towards antiplatelet. The treat CAD study was done um, and examined uh, the same similar 
uh, interventions. But they restricted the antiplatelet therapy to just aspirin, and the comparison anticoagulation was um, heparin initially and then bridging to vitamin K anticoagulation. Um, they also used MRI to increase the yield of outcomes. Uh, they included clinical and MRI outcomes, and they showed that there were more events in the antiplatelet arm, suggesting that anticoagulation is the better approach for patients who can handle it. Um, a bit more detail when you look into the studies, the Cadiz study, when the imaging um, core lab reviewed the study, about 20% of the patients where we thought had dissections didn't meet criteria for dissections showing us that even in the modern era um, that um, diagnosis of dissection is challenging. So whenever I see a dissection patient, I really look and try to make sure, is this really a dissection? Um, uh, a, a few more kind of tips from the study, the intracranial hemorrhage that they did have was in a patient that had an extension of their dissection intracranially and was treated with anticoagulation. So then that's kind of the point that if the dissection is extended past the dura. So in the posterior circulation, it's a V4 segment, and in the anterior circulation, it's after the ophthalmic artery or after the clinoid process. Um, uh, the treat CAD study, uh, even when they took out the MRI outcome patients, based on clinical outcomes alone, anticoagulation still did outperform. Um, antiplatelet therapy. This is a patient that I would treat usually with anticoagulation. They have a high thrombus burden. It's a carotid artery dissection uh, and it's quite uh, extended. And this patient doesn't have contraindication, so it's a good candidate for um, uh, anticoagulation. Uh, now, swinging back to our trauma population to see how do we um, take the different trials and different studies that we have and put them together. When it comes to traumatic artery dissections, often these patients have other injuries like liver acerations, um, uh, splenic injuries, small subdurals that are subtle. Um, uh, so anticoagulation becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, we can't give these patients TPA. I'm not talking about the trivial trauma chiropractic maneuver patients. We're talking about motor vehicle collisions, these kind of patients. Mechanical thrombectomy is still an option. Um, for the kind of interluminal thrombus or stenosis patients, generally antithrombotic therapy with aspirin is recommended or with anticoagulation if the patient can tolerate it. And that's a discussion with your trauma team. Usually we act as consultants. Um, I'm at a busy trauma center and we see dissection patients um, probably once every one to two weeks. Last week we had two dissection patients, one with a pseudoaneurysm and one with a V3 dissection. Um, and we give the recommendations to the trauma team and they kind of incorporate it within the plan of care. Uh, and we really try to manage medically for these injuries. Pseudoaneurysms, we get early imaging a week afterwards. If the pseudoaneurysm in the carotid artery is large or expanding, we will reconstruct the vessel uh, depending or embolize the pseudoaneurysm depending on what else is going on with the patient traumatically. When it comes to the vertebral artery, the pseudoaneurysms don't have to grow to that size for us to intervene. And a grade five injury with active intraxervation, it's emergent endovascular control. So some cases, 71 year old woman with, with uh, hypertension was in a motor vehicle collision with headache. She has a seat belt sign on the left side of her, of her uh, neck. She's neurologically intact. At baseline, she's on aspirin at home. She actually had a carotid artery dissection on the right. It's really, really subtle. Um, we manage this patient by continuing her aspirin. We, Trauma team was okay with it. We got a repeated CT scan. She actually had a, a little traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, very small amount, but neurosurgery cleared her for continuing her aspirin, and she did not require any intervention, and the dissection uh, was stable on the repeat imaging. She's coming to see me in clinic in two weeks. This is a, a little bit more involved history. This patient came in, 45-year-old man, with a pseudoaneurysm that's growing. Uh, Three weeks prior, he was in a trauma. We diagnosed the pseudoaneurysm, and then on the repeat imaging, it was growing. He had multiple injuries elsewhere, all of which had repaired. Um, and this is what the pseudoaneurysm looked like. You can see the 
towards the top of the of the screen there, the kind of outpouching of the pseudo aneurysm. The sec the third image is the cranial view working projection, and it's at the bottom of the image where you see the pseudo aneurysm. And that's the reconstruction on the left showing the external carotid artery, internal carotid artery in the bottom side with the pseudo aneurysm and showing the mass effect from the pseudo aneurysm, stenosing the parent internal carotid artery. And that's often how patients get strokes. We reconstructed this using flow diverters and stents. So extracranial pseudo aneurysms, how do we manage them? So um, this is blunt supervascular injury grade three. Generally, we put the patient on an antithrombotic, aspirin is favored, we monitor it in the carotid circulation. If it grows to one and a half or one centimeters, we would intervene or if it's, or if it's dynamically growing, if it's either big or dynamically growing. Uh, a vertebral artery, you won't wait till that size because you don't get to that size with the vertebral artery. Um, coiling, stenting, flow diversion are different endovascular techniques we can use depending on the anatomy and what's going on with the patient. Intracranially, these patients are much more at risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage, or they actually are at risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So they fall into two groups. The ruptured group we treat like any other subarachnoid hemorrhage patient. So you follow the protocols, nemodipine, external ventricular drain if they need it. And most of the therapy is endovascular, uh, depending on the anatomy and the collateral circulation. If they're unruptured, uh, we avoid antithrombotics. Um, except in rare circumstances like the MCA patient, I told you that we put, him on, put her on a baby aspirin or low dose aspirin, I should say. Um, early endovascular treatment versus monitoring is heavily debated. Most of us favor early endovascular treatment because the high risk of high incidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage in this patient population, about 50%. However, I'll show you an example of a patient where we did not need to do that. Um, um, this patient came to me with a second opinion from another neurologist in, in, in Texas, uh, who's actually excellent at taking care of the sections. A uh, 51-year-old woman um, came in with a, initially her history, she had a right vertebral artery dissection with pain, no ischemic stroke, treated medically, follow-up imaging suggested a pseudoaneurysm. She had an angiogram and wasn't treated because of unfavorable anatomy. And she came to see me for a second opinion a few months down the road. That's her initial CTA. CTAs are flipped when they reconstruct them. So the, the V4 segment post pica has a dissection, it's expanded. And that's the MRA there in follow up one year later. After I discussed with her, we decided to do non-invasive monitoring with MRA and it's remained stable since. This is uh, the um, uh, image, the uh, kind of axials. Hopefully, the image will play. Oh, the image didn't play, but it basically goes through this and shows you the dissection and how the vessel expands and and, and looks for us. Um, another case of intracranial dissection in the posterior circulation. This patient is a 37-year-old man that collapsed and presented in a coma. Um, on examination, he had reactive pupils and withdrew to, withdrew to pain. CT showed subarachnoid hemorrhage and hydrocephalus. Past medical history was hypertension and actually excess alcohol intake. An external ventricular drain was placed and cerebral angiogram was performed showing this uh, expanded vertebral artery uh, with a dissecting aneurysm that involved the origin of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. He did not have a posterior inferior cerebellar artery, so he did not have a, a pica stroke, did not have a cerebellar stroke. Um, and we reconstructed this using an old technique called multiple overlapping stents. We put them in there to kind of scaffold the artery and allow it to heal and a little bit reduce the flow uh, into the aneurysm uh, and follow the rest of the subarachnoid hemorrhage protocol. Uh, follow up at three and nine months, he was neurologically intact apart from some features of a Wallenberg syndrome, right lower extremity temperature uh, um, sensation deficits. And this is a follow-up imaging showing Reconstruction of the vertebral artery, there's still a residual aneurysm at the origin of the, of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. We didn't retreat this, it's been stable on monitoring and the patient's following up with us in the clinic. Another case, this is a gunshot wound to the um, neck, 54 year old man. Um, and the CTA suggested extravasation around the vertebral arteries. This patient also had, we had a cerebral angiogram, had two injuries, 
extravasation from the ascending pharyngeal artery, which we embolized, and also this injury, an arterial venous fistula with a vertebral artery, fistula point, and then the venous plexus enhancing. We did an embolization, a sacrifice of that artery because the collaterals were good, and the collaterals on the left image showed complete collateral circulation to the, the posterior circulation, and the patient did not have any neurological deficits. So the treatment summary of spontaneous dissections, you know, including trivial trauma, these are candidates for IV thrombolytic if it's an extra dural or extracranial dissection, and they don't have other contraindications. Mechanical thrombectomy can be for, performed for these patients. Um, secondary prevention, if they don't have contraindications, we probably should be favoring anticoagulation early, uh, I mean, uh, in the initial phase for most patients, but anti antiplatelet therapy is an option for these patients. Um, for patients who fail endovas uh, medical management, uh, pseudo have pseudoaneurysms or AV fistulas, endovascular therapy can be considered, uh, and there are different means of doing that. For the traumatic dissections, it's kind of based on the grading, uh, mainly antithrombotics using aspirin, favored more so than heparin in these situations. Uh, for pseudoaneurysm, there's monitoring plus endovascular therapy if appropriate. Um, and see endovascular therapy for active extravasation, especially in the posterior circulation because it's very hard to access surgically. Uh, in the carotid artery in the neck, sometimes there are surgical options, even though most of the times we're moving to endovascular currently. So most importantly, our patients. What are their ideas, their concerns, their expectations? Um, obviously, this is very individualized, and this is where the art of medicine comes into it. Patients generally want to get back to normal. Uh, they want to know what about what's the recurrence risk. Thankfully, it is low, and that does require quite a, a bit of education. They often are ex uh, um, concerned about act activities, what to do when it comes exercise, work, sexual activity. What about pregnancy for our younger patients with dissection and breastfeeding? Um, obviously, we're neurologists. We take care of patients with neurological symptoms and um, uh, all the concerns with dysphagia, hemiplegia, hemiparesis, cognitive dysfunction comes into play for patients who have stroke and non-neurological symptoms such as fatigue and pain. Um, there's no real solid body of evidence except that the, the, the recurrence rate on treatment is quite low and even after stopping antiplatelet therapy. What's Based on expert opinion, uh, reasonable, um, and based on the review of risk factors, um, moderate aerobic exercise is probably recommended. Um, a weight training can be done, especially if we avoid overhead uh, manipulations um, uh, with a low weight and higher uh, uh, repetitions. We have caution with certain yoga poses if they have the neck and, uh, uh, and head in extreme positions. Uh, probably we should avoid roller coasters, chiropractic neck manipulations, um, heavy contact sports, mixed martial arts, uh, or abrupt high intensity exercise or heavy, heavy lifting, especially above the head. Um, uh, anecdotally, for in my clinic, uh, I can't tell you the number of young patients with this section who are fearful to return to exercise. Uh, and usually after their vessels have recovered, uh, counsel them about gradually getting back to exercise. And exercise in that age group of 30 to 40 to 50 is really important for improving cardiovascular risk, but also as we know now, um, a cognitive function later on in life. A cup, one book recommendation recommended to me by my patient um, is that first one written by a speech pathologist and a neurologist. Uh, I think one of them suffered from a dissection uh, herself. Uh, it does cover uh, a lot of the recent evidence, including the CADIS trial, but doesn't get into the treat cat trial because it came in later. Um, but it still is a good source. And an article that you can pull up, that's a two-pager patient-focused article from the Journal of uh, Vascular Medicine that is uh, quite useful for patients as well. And I'll uh, take to any questions if there are any.
how about the duration of the anticoagulants? I uh, have seen three months for extracranial, six months for intracranial. Yeah, there's no great evidence for that, except that we know that by six months, uh, about three quarters of the patients resolve uh, their, their uh, dissection, and those that are, remain with the stability in their occlusion, um, there is no great evidence, but I think between three to six months is most recommendations. So typically in my clinic, if the patient's on antiplatelet, I would scan them at six months. If they're on anticoagulation because people don't want to be on warfarin, we'd scan them at three months to see if there's resolution and then switch them to antiplatelet earlier. For younger patients who have complete resolution, um, some of them can come off of anti, uh, all the antithrombotics. But most patients, I encourage them, again, I don't have good evidence base for it, to stay on an aspirin 81 milligram eventually. So uh, three to six months either way is fine. Uh, again, this is not based on class one evidence. I tend to scan my patients who are on anticoagulation at three months because if we can get off the anticoagulation sooner. Thank you.